So one of the best ways to teach number sense is a pedagogical strategy that's been really growing over recent years as a kind of grassroots movement um, called number talks. Sometimes they're called math talks. And they were started by Ruth Parker and Kathy Richardson. You may use these already, um, but I know many people don't, and we're going to try one together in a moment. The way they work is, in a classroom, you would ask students to work out a problem mentally in their heads, without written work, without writing. Um, and when they've answered the problem, students are asked to just put up their thumb. No hands, because um, when students are putting their hands up as soon as they're finished, it's intimidating for people who haven't finished. And I'm going to just show you the way a number talk is introduced, just the first piece now with the use of thumbs. So this was a number talk that Kathy Humphreys gave to our elementary teachers at Stanford. And we're just going to watch the beginning here to see how a number talk is started. Okay, so on this card there are some shapes. And when I put the card up, I'd like you to figure out how many there are without counting one by one. So take a quick glimpse of them. And when, you're, when you do think you know how many there are, then put your thumb up to show me. Ready? So before we watch a couple of different number talks, I want to try some of the mathematical ideas with you together. So the first thing I'm going to ask you is just simply to write down the answer without using pen and paper. Uh, try not to use a, the traditional algorithm, but work out and write down the answer for 18 times 5. So you probably got that the answer is 90. Um, but the answer is probably not the most interesting part. The most interesting part of number talks is really thinking about how you arrived at that answer. As, of course, number problems can be seen in many different ways. And it turns out that not only are students fascinated by the different methods, but they really learn a lot from thinking about the methods, about how and why they work. So I'm gonna, we're going to hear now from some Stanford students who were asked to solve this problem and hear the different methods they used. Uh, that would be 90. Okay, and how did you get 90? I, well, first I doubled 18, getting 36, then I doubled that, getting 72, and then I added 18 again, so okay. that was my 90. And how did you do that? Um, so I take 18 and I have that. 9 times 5, 45, 9 times 5, 45, add them together, 90. 18 times 5 is? 80? How'd you get 80? Uh, 5 times 10 plus 5 times 8. No, 90. <laughs> 90. Uh-huh. And uh, can you just describe your method of how you got to that? I did 9 times 10 instead of 18 times 5, because same thing. Um, well, I'll do it out loud then. 18 times 5. OK, hopefully I don't get this wrong as I'm doing it. I do 20 times 5, so 2 times 5 is 10, add a 0. Um, Two times five, that, that'd be 100. Um, and then minus two times five again. So that would be minus 10. That'd be 90, I think. But I might have gone on. Okay, good. 18 times five. Um, okay, is it 90? Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, so how did you reach that? Um, <laughs> honestly, I tried doing like you know, the whole 18 and then five under and like eight times five. And then I realized that um, it's easier to just do, okay, well, first of all, you are doing eight times five, which is 40. And then if you do the one times five, which is actually 10 times five, that's the 50. And then you just add them together, which is the 90. Awesome. But those are little numbers. <laughs> like I wouldn't be able to do big yeah. numbers. Yeah, that's 90 because 18 over two is eight times 10. I mean nine. It's 18 over two is nine times 10, which is 90. 90. Mm -hmm. So how did you reach it? Um, well, to do it quickly, I separated it into 10 and 8. So 5 times 10 is easy, that's 50, and then 5 times 8 is 40, and then you just add them together. I feel like I should be able to answer 18 times 5 pretty quickly, but I can't. Um, it takes a while. Um, I do know it's 90. I think I'd probably do it uh, with the 18 on top and then the 5 on the bottom and then 5 times 8 and 5 times 1 and then add it together. It's probably a pretty slow way of doing it. 
So one thing that's nice about Number Talks is the solutions, the different methods that are used can be drawn in these different ways. So I'm going to draw out here um, the different ways the students that we just saw solved this problem. So we can also visually represent the students' methods and I haven't, I'm not going to do all of them but you may want to visually represent them all. Um, it's a really good thing to do. So I might represent Neil's method. He didn't work out 18 times 5. He worked out 9 times 5 and 9 times 5 in this way. Whereas Casey um, divided her 18 into 9 and multiplied the 5 by 2 to make it 10. So she worked out 9 times 10, which I might represent in this way. Sammy broke the 18 into 10 and 8 uh, and multiplied it in that way. Whereas Jamie made the 18 into a 20 um, and then subtracted the extra 2 times 5, which I would represent in that way. And there were some other methods. Maybe you can visually represent those. But providing that visual representation is really important to help students with number sense. And you can also get them to visually represent their own methods. Um, or sometimes what I've done is we've looked at all the different representations and then I've said, well, uh, what I'd like you to do now is use, for example, Casey's method um, to work out 20 times 14 or whatever the question is. Or after working on Casey's method, see if you can use Sammy's method. So the visual representation of the problems is really great. So another nice thing to do with number talks is after we have a representation of the solutions, what I've done with students is to say, OK, now we have another problem, which might be 12 times 8 or something similar, and to say, um, what I'd like you to do is see if you can use Zach's method to use this problem. We've also uh, done work with giving students visuals and having them match the visual to the um, method. So I'm going to give you another problem to do now so we can think about different solutions. So this time I'd like you, again, without um, using the traditional algorithm and without um, using pen and paper, see if you can solve the problem 12 times 15. And again, I'd like you to show your method. So there are many different ways of solving that problem, and I'm going to show you some here. Maybe you used one of them, maybe you used a whole different one. But as you can see from these different problems, uh, different solutions, when um, we show these to students, and it's very important for the teacher to do the representing in a number talk to make the mathematics that's up very, very clear for students. Um, but what she can do is use number talks to help with algebraic thinking. And you can see how these um, properties, such as the associative and distributive uh, properties, are illustrated. And we can help students with those. So here are five of the different methods. Um, and the first one that you can see 15 times 10, broken up into 15 times 10, 15 times 2, makes use of the distributive property. And there's a drawing, uh, I've made a drawing for that one. And then we have two methods that make use of a doubling and halving strategy. Slightly different methods with very similar visuals. Um, so it can be important to separate different methods, even if they look the same, because we want to capture different ways of thinking. And then a couple more that again use the distributive property. I didn't draw this one where um, we break up the 15 into 10 and 5. And this one again where we break up the 12 into 15 into 12 and 3, sorry, again uses the distributive property. And this is where number talks can be really helpful in the beginning stages of algebra in having kids break up the numbers, see a visual, visual, and understand both how that's represented correctly uh, in mathematical notation and to think about the distributive property. So I'm going to show you three, uh, a couple more now that use the associative property. So these two methods use the associative property. And again, it's really useful to see the numbers uh, written out with the correct representations. Also, really nice to see these visually, and I was going to draw those for you. I found it interesting thinking about those, and then I thought I would leave them uh, undrawn so that you can think about how those would be drawn. It's uh, kind of interesting 
problem to work on, I promise. So see if you can think about how those might be drawn visually. It can also be nice uh, with these kind of mathematical thinking to represent the solutions with multi-link cubes. But those another two solutions, there are many more, but these uh, nicely illustrate the associative property. So number talks can be done by teachers in the whole class, um, as we're going to see. All parents can also do mini number talks with their children just by asking them the number problems and then challenging them to find a, a different solution, to work with a problem with a different method. Having kids solve problems in different ways teaches them a very, very important building block in number sense and mathematics. They, it is teaching them the, an ability and willingness to break numbers apart or decompose them and regroup them. This turns out to be a very important foundational base from which all other mathematics builds, as Sebastian talked about. They also teach students something very important, which is that math is a creative and flexible subject. And this is so important. Um, an English mathematician, Walter Sawyer, who wrote the book A Mathematician's Delight, once wrote uh, this. He said, the depressing thing about arithmetic badly taught is that it destroys a child's intellect and to some extent his integrity. Before they're taught arithmetic, children will not give their assent to utter nonsense. Afterwards, they will. And we certainly have a lot of evidence of that. We need children to understand numbers, not to blindly remember methods that they use, um, but to really understand why they work and how um, the methods may be used. And number talks work really well at different levels. I think they're great to use in mixed groups of students. I've given that problem 8 times 15, that exact same problem, to elementary students, to Stanford undergrads, to CEOs of companies, and people have engaged with it with equal interest and excitement and really loved seeing the different methods and thinking about them. Luke Bartlett is the executive director of Wolfram Alpha, a site you probably know and love if you're a maths teacher. And he read my book and wrote to me saying, you have no idea how many times I now ask people to calculate 18 times 5. So it turns out people are really interested in seeing all the different ways in which people are able to think about these number problems. Um, and as I said, I've used them in different settings and found people to be super engaged. And really, you just see their eyes light up when a problem is solved in lots of different ways. As, as people come to understand the creativity in numbers and in maths. I taught algebra to a group of uh, pretty disaffected 7th uh, and 8th graders in the US um, a short while ago, and I'm going to talk about it more in the algebra session. But we started every lesson with a number talk, and they absolutely blew students' minds. They had never before seen problems, particularly bare number problems, solved in all of these different ways, and it really changed their view of maths and what's possible. And when we interviewed students at the end of the program, it was really the number talks that had amazed them the most. And it led to the students saying things like this. One of the students we interviewed said, it's like the way, the way our schools did it is like very black and white. And the way people do it here, it's like very colorful, very bright. You have very different varieties you're looking at. You can look at it one way, turn your head, and all of a sudden you see a whole different picture. So it really helped give them a much more authentic view of mathematics. And they're great to use in heterogeneous groups, which of course all groups of students are heterogeneous, because what we'll find is some people are helped just by seeing the method and how to solve the problem, whereas students who are at a higher level are really uh, benefit from seeing the different solution paths. Sometimes students are, who are working at a high level only have one way of thinking about maths. Um, Number ticks are also the only very quick pedagogical practice that I know of that teaches number fluency and automaticity at the same time as a conceptual understanding of number. And you may think that they're not needed with more advanced classes, such as high school classes, um, students taking geometry and algebra, but at Stanford, what we've found is that the high school students who are given number talks are the worst at the same exact problems given to younger children. They are the least able to use number sense, um, and they really struggle with even the most basic number problems. Kathy Humphreys conducted a study in the past year with geometry classes in high school, regular on-track students, 
uh, not behind in any way. But when the students were given number problems, they really struggled. They could, they tried to use procedures that they'd learned. Um, they were saying things like, oh, I have to carry the one or cross out the three, um, writing with their fingers in the air. But they were really unable to use numbers since they were unable at first to use numbers flexibly. Um, to break them apart and recombine them to make them easier.